I was looking over all the books that I read in the year 2022 and I realized that there was only one book, one book that I rated five out of five stars this year and that there were only 10 books that I rated four stars or higher. And as I always do with these kind of videos, I will go in depth into who I think would really enjoy these books and who I think might not really enjoy these books so that this video is also helpful for you so you can decide if you want to pick up these stories or not. Look at the steam coming from this cup of tea. Love. Okay. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm very sorry. Hello. My name is Leonie. Welcome to this riveting area of the internet where we talk about books. If you're new here, welcome. Let's talk. The drink of choice today is of course another cup of tea. This time it is a black tea with a hint of orange and cinnamon. First for number 10, we have a book that I started reading over the summer while I was finishing up my master's thesis. So every day my mind was swirling with thoughts of neurobiology and academic writing. And you know that feeling that you get when you stare at a screen for too long and your head just gets completely foggy and clogged up? That was my state like 24 7 and at that time it made me so happy that at the end of each day I could use the last summer rays that were in my parents backyard to sit down and read just a fun little romance book and that for me was Book Lovers by Emily Henry. Now during this last month of my thesis I had been making my way through all of Emily Henry's works and so far her stories have been a little bit more emotional a little bit more serious than what I was looking for at that time of academic despair. So Book Lovers with its more lighter tone was perfect. You get the standard Emily Henry wittiness and outstanding banter between the characters while still maintaining a kind of depth in their personality. And I think maybe as I was working on my thesis so much, I just connected on a soul level to our main character, Nora, who is this workaholic cutthroat literary agent. She moves to this small town where no one is on her level except for her work nemesis, Charlie, who happens to also be there. This book has one of my favorite romance dynamics of all time, and that is the we are different in the same way. Nora, our main character, is often seen as uptight and stern and overly organized, but so is Charlie. There are so many scenes where it becomes evident that Nora's uptightness is at odds with everyone around her, except when she's put together with Charlie. That is when they just work together, like a well-oiled machine and they appreciate this well preparedness in each other. They have so much respect for each other but they think that they don't like each other but that's just because they see in each other these aspects that they had learned to dislike in themselves. You see what I mean? Also, I've always found that the way Emily Henry writes her romantic interactions feel different from the other romance books that I've read. Not that I've read that many, um, <laughs> but you know. I've come to the conclusion that this is because Emily Henry allows her characters to just shamelessly flirt with each other. Often romance novels are so overloaded with layers of book logic and forbidden romance and hate to love dynamics that the characters don't often just openly flirt with each other, but Emily Henry allows her characters to do that and Nora and Charlie definitely do this a lot. I really think there's nothing as naturally filled with romantic and sexual tension as seeing two characters openly flirt with each other. And it gives the romance a very realistic vibe to it. I will say, although this is Emily Henry's most feel-good romance story, if you really are looking for something very easy and fluffy and happy, Emily Henry will still not be your thing, even with book lovers. Moving on to number nine. So early 2020, I discovered the Dark Academia aesthetic on Tumblr. I even made my own Dark Academia posts. You will never find them. And I was kind of struggling to find motivation for my studies, and I really found a lot of solace into this inter internet aesthetic that romanticized studying and learning. And even after having read pretty much every derivative 
of the original Dark Academia book, I still had never read the actual original Dark Academia book. But this year, I finally picked up The Secret History by Donna Tartt. And you can see, looking at the tabs, you can see I had thoughts. <laughs> This is the book about the five elite classical language students that are driven to kill one of them and the psychological effects that follow. A true Greek tragedy. So I have about an hour long video on this channel where I go in depth into this book, but I will try to give you the spark notes summary of my opinions. Impeccable use of tension buildup by telling us on the first page who they're going to kill. A masterclass in nuanced character writing, using so many different scenes and interactions as small building blocks into a greater character work. Great critique of elitism in academia and the classism that often comes with this elitism and the illusion of elitism. And it does a fantastic job at making you, the reader, believe in this illusion only to then break it down right in front of you. And this, this book just makes fun of pretentious people which I also like. So I had already created this idea of what the book was going to be based on all the people online being like, oh my God, I want to be like Henry Winter. I wish I was Camilla. I wish I had a little friend group like these people. Only to then read the book and finding out that like the image that I had of this book based on other people's like edits of it was completely wrong. I think what you see online of this book is mostly the illusion that the story is presenting to its reader, uh, but not really the breakdown of said illusion. I've said illusion a lot of times, but that is the theme of this book. This book is great for anyone who's ever had to deal with like pretentious people at university, especially if you are maybe secretly a little bit pretentious yourself as well. Uh, I don't recommend this if you are expecting like a fast paced murder mystery thriller, because it's not that. It's, it's a pretty slow book. It's a pretty slow book. Number eight on this list is the only book that I listen to on an audiobook and don't own a physical copy of. I think like most people watching here, I really grew up with a Nickelodeon then Schneider phase, you know, Zoe 101, Victorious, and especially iCarly. I even watched a five hour video essay on that show here on YouTube somehow. So I did know that there were some controversial things going on on the set of a lot of Dan Schneider series, but I never really knew the full extent of it. So when I heard that Jeanette McCurdy, who played Sam, was writing a biography and I had written a biography that really piqued my interest and I really uh, wanted to read it. And then I read it and I realized that it, it's so much more than just about her time at iCarly. I'm not really a biography person, I never really read biography, but this was, well I want to say the best biography that I've ever read, but I haven't really read any because I'm usually not interested in them, <laughs> but this one blew me away. She does such a phenomenal job at using humor and just masterful storytelling to tell her life story, which really just has so many things going on in there. It's, it's, yes, it is also about her time as a child actor, um, but it is mostly, I think, about her relationship with her abusive mother and her eating disorder. But then it also goes into alcoholism, toxic family environments, other abusive relationships. And I highly recommend listening to the audiobook like I did because it is narrated by Jeanette McCurdy herself. You can very clearly tell that she is an actor so she can narrate and voice act really really well and it really added this extra dimension to it because there really are moments where Jeanette McCurdy like audibly tears up while reading the book, um, which makes you as the listener tear up as well. Um, and it really feels like she is telling her story to you. But because this book deals with so many different dark topics, I do recommend looking up the trigger warnings to see if maybe this book might be for you. Coming in at number seven, I have Beautiful World, Where Are You? by Sally Rooney, the book for middle-class white women who care about progressive politics. Um, but at least the book is self-aware in that aspect. That being said, this book did indeed really 
make me feel seen. Controversial opinion maybe, but I really think that this book is better than Normal People by Sally Rooney. To me, this book is about the simplicity of life juxtaposed against what seems to be a world full of complexity and doom. And this is complemented by Sally Rooney's minimalistic and simplistic writing style that she uses to describe simple and minimalistic moments in everyday life. Right, like sometimes a chapter ends with just a description of a cereal bowl on the table and like the buses going by in the street and I read it and I'm like, oh, that's genius. <laughs> I know Sally Rooney is often dubbed as the author for the sad fleabag girlies, but this book is surprisingly uplifting. Um, I will read to you my favorite quote of the entire book. My favorite Sally Rooney quote that I think might give you a little bit of an idea um, of what the vibe of this book is. What if the meaning of life on earth is not eternal progress towards some unspecified goal? The engineering and production of more and more powerful technologies, the development of more and more complex and abstruse cultural forms. What if these things just rise and recede naturally, like tides, while the meaning of life remains the same as always? Just to live and be with other people. You may have noticed that I haven't talked about the plot of this book yet, and that is because it genuinely doesn't matter. There barely is any, and it shouldn't be. <laughs> it's just about two friends living their life, being a little bit unsufferable, and being kind of like worrisomely relatable in their insufferability. <laughs> they write each other these letters, music on the state of the world and politics and capitalism. And the book is, I think, most criticized for being a little bit pretentious. I personally disagree with that statement because there's nothing ingenuine about the way these characters are speaking to each other. They are not talking about these things to seem more interesting. In fact, it feels more like diary entries that are not even meant to be seen by other people, only their one friend. So if that sounds like something you can relate to, you will enjoy this book. But if the idea of people talking about like politics and philosophy sounds very annoying to you, then then you are probably going to be very annoyed by the characters in this book. Next, I have two books in the same series that both made it to this top 10 list. So I'm sure we've all experienced that feeling where there's a book that is extremely popular. It is super hyped. Everyone's talking about it. And you just kind of think to yourself, mm, I don't think this book is going to be for me. And the more people keep talking about it and hyping it up, you keep trying to think to yourself, should I read it? No, no, it, it's probably really not my thing. And then your friend organizes a book club. Okay, maybe now this is becoming a, a more niche to my personal experience and not like general, but you know, at that moment, your friend organizes a book club uh, and they decide to read this very hyped and popular series for the book club. And you think, okay, you know what? Maybe I'll give it a try just for funsies so I can talk about it in the book club. I'm not gonna buy a copy of the book because I probably won't even enjoy it. I'll just listen to the audiobook. And then you come to the book club and everyone there was kind of disappointed in the book. Didn't really think it lived up to the hype. And lo and behold, you are the only person in the book club that actually loved it. I am talking about the Folk of the Air trilogy. The first book, The Cruel Prince, and the second book, The Wicked King. I also have the third book, but uh, I haven't read that yet. It feels a little bit weird to put these two books above masterful authors like Donna Tartt and Sally Rooney. Um, but you know, in terms of enjoyment, these two books through the roof, they defeat all of the competition. Before I read the series, I thought I wasn't a fan of Fae stories. Turns out I am, as long as they are really close to the folklore. These are Fae that are cunning, they can't lie, they're always trying to strike deals with you and manipulate you to join things that are always gonna be ending up bad for you probably. We get a main character, Jude, that is the opposite of what we are used to from YA fantasy. She is rude, she is mean, she is ambitious, she is using people for her own gain. Do not read this if you don't like characters that are just being mean. If the idea of characters just 
backstabbing and constantly humiliating each other doesn't sound fun and engaging to you as it sounds to me um, then you're probably not gonna like this series and don't read this book if you are expecting it to fully be enemies to lovers this is one of those books that kind of um, fell victim to incorrect TikTok marketing TikTok really hyped this book up as an enemies to lovers book because TikTok really likes to talk about tropes uh, in terms of books and then people were of course very disappointed that there was barely no romance in this book at all. I'll just have you know that despite indeed being very enemies to lovers, the romance takes a big backseat into the story, which is more about spying and political intrigue. That being said, it is one of the best enemies to lovers I've ever read because they're actually enemies. If you like your enemies to lovers being a more subtle hate to romantic progression kind of lovers um this is not gonna be for you but to me nothing screams tension like two characters doing unspeakable horror to each other then at number four oh i also don't own a physical copy of this one either it's becoming a trend where every year i read one one short story and then that short story also ends up on my favorite books of the year list. So maybe I should probably just read more short stories. I think I said the same thing last year. Somehow I just keep deciding to pick up like 500 page tomes instead. Last year, this was the yellow wallpaper. This year, it is The Ones Who Walk Away from Amalaz by Ursula K. Le Guin. I think it is a sign of an amazingly skilled author if you can write a story that takes more time to discuss than to read itself. Like this story is only nine pages and I think when we discussed it live together we spent like at least half an hour talking about it. So here's how the story goes. We are introduced to this fictional utopia of Omelas where everyone is happy, everyone is prosperous and healthy. But the only way that Omelas can exist like this with no trouble and no sickness is because there is one child that has to be tortured and locked up for its entire lifetime while barely being kept alive. And the story poses the question, is this righteous? And at first glance, this seems like a fairly standard utilitarianism kind of question. You know, I'm sure we've all heard of the trolley problem. Like, should you kill one person to save many? But I like that this story in only nine pages can touch on I think the main problem with utilitarianism and that is that you can never really know for sure. There's this constant feeling of okay but is, the, is it really the case that this child needs to be tortured in order to keep everyone happy or is this just what everyone believes and just accepts as the state of the world without trying to maybe find a way around it or find out if it actually works that way. And secondly, yes, this story can somehow touch on two big themes in only nine pages. It touches on how we as readers respond to stories about happiness. How we tend to find stories that explore happiness more shallow and uninteresting. And how we tend to only believe the validity of this utopian society the moment that we are introduced to its dark side. This is my favorite quote from the story. The trouble is that we have a bad habit, encouraged by pedants and sophisticates, of considering happiness as something rather stupid. Only pain is intellectual, only evil interesting. And this is something that I also try to keep in mind when I'm reviewing books or reading books. Often when a book can elicit a positive emotion like happiness or hope, we're more likely to just see it as like frivolous entertainment. But when a story can elicit strong feelings of sadness or anger, that's when we're more likely to consider it a deep and interesting work of literature. This story is great if you like short sci-fi stories that explore an idea or a concept, but don't expect like a fully well-rounded storyline. Okay, my tea has almost gone cold, <laughs> but we've now reached the top three, the three books of this year that I would consider my favorite, new favorites. For number three, I need to take you back to January last year. I was in a big reading slump. I was kind of a little down with just 
trying to get into my new internship and getting used to everything and you know the dark January days I came across this TikTok on BookTok it, it wasn't a very popular one but it was about this girl kind of the it's like showing her obsession with this book about violence and obsession and pain um, and somehow I was like that sounds cool <laughs> And I was very happy to see that the book happened to be on Storytel, which is the app that I use for audiobooks. So I thought, you know what, let me just give it a, a listen. L let's just give it a try, you know. Um, and then I spent the entire weekend playing Genshin Impact and listening to this audiobook. I remember on Sunday, I, I think I listened to about eight hours of this audiobook, just the entire day. I was listening and I loved it so much. Uh, of course, I'm talking about These Violent Delights by Micah Nimmer Ever. I am convinced the only reason that this book did not become more popular is because of marketing confusion, because it came out in a similar time when These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong came out, which is a very popular YA fantasy. It's the 1970s, Pittsburgh. It takes place at university and the entire book surrounds the relationship of these two young boys. At the one hand we have Paul who is very misunderstood, intellectual, he loves Nietzsche, nobody understands him except for another boy at this university, Julian, who is very extroverted and charming and the top of his class and they are the only people who fully see each other, who fully understand each other and they start the secret relationship that very quickly spirals into something highly toxic, codependent and dark. And if you're listening to me talking about this and thinking, okay, so like what's great about that, then you're probably not gonna love this book. But if you listen to me talking about that and you think, oh my god, yes, I want to read about horrendous relationships like this. Um, it's a good one. <laughs> this book is definitely peak dark academia with insufferable characters that um, sometimes make you think, um, why is this insufferable character saying something relatable and what does that say about me? I do have to note that this book doesn't get that dark. Like if you're really expecting something like bones and all kind of relationship, it's not like that. It, it, it stays pretty tame, but it is a dark academia thriller kind of book. Then we are at number two. I remember going to the library to get this book eight years ago when I was still in secondary school and I was excited to read an interesting English classic and I was standing in the library with this book in my hands and I read the first page just to check it out. And I remember thinking, oh no, this is... I do not understand anything of what's going on here. This is too high of an English level for me because I'm not a native English speaker. So I didn't bring it home and I put it back on the library shelf. Um, and I did at some point acquire my own copy of it, but for years it had just been sitting on my shelf because every time I looked at it, I was reminded of that version of me eight years ago standing in the library being intimidated by the first page of the book and the only thing that I could see was that physical copy on my shelf of 500 pages of English classic literature. And I recently picked it up. I'm talking of course about Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte and I am just so disappointed by the fact that I thought that this book was going to be too intimidating for me. I didn't pick this up because I was stopped by my own idea that classic English literature books are super complex and only for very intellectual people. And my own insecurity in that aspect robbed me of a wonderful reading experience that I could have had years ago. And the writing style, the English, is very doable. You just have to get used to it a little bit, but then 
it reads very smoothly. It is unbelievable how relatable a character written almost 200 years ago can be. We see Jane struggling with the pains of growing up, not feeling like she belongs, struggling with authority, struggling with the expectations that are put on her as a woman in that time. And also there is nothing like 19th century romance in a 19th century writing style. I just have to read to you a quote that perfectly exemplifies the beautiful writing style and just the... Oh man, it's a 19th century romance? Uh, let me just... It's gonna speak for itself. Okay. This is Mr. Rochester saying to Jane Eyre, I sometimes have a queer feeling with regard to you, especially when you are near me, as now. It is as if I had a string somewhere under my left ribs, tightly and inextricably knotted to a similar string situated in the corresponding quarter of your little frame. That's not even the best of it. There's so many more moments like this in this book. For full transparency, I haven't finished the book yet. I still have a little bit left, but I'm already certain that it's going to be four or four and a half stars. Something really weird has to happen to make me suddenly hate this book. I will say because this is a pretty old book, especially towards the end, you do have to deal with people of color and mentally ill people being talked about um, in particularly poor taste. And even though I know that this is common for that time, that doesn't make it any less hard to read. So that is something to keep in mind if you pick up this book. Sometimes they go on weird tangents about the shape of their skull and what it has to say about their personality. Gotta love that old fashioned uh, phrenology psychology. Okay, we've moved on to number one. The only book this year that I gave five out of five stars. I have this problem where I lay too much value on the average Goodreads rating. If the average Goodreads rating of a book is below four stars, I assume that it's gonna be mid. And I only wanna pick up books that I think are going to be amazing. So why would I want to pick up a book that a lot of people thought was just fine and good, but not amazing. But this year I realized that sometimes a book has an average rating of three and a half stars, not because most people think it's mid, but because some people really don't like it, most people, and then some people absolutely love it. And that was the case uh, for Bunny by Mona Awad. This book starts off as your average dark academia story, you know, takes place at university, the main character is a little bit alternative, there's some good satire of university life, the pretentiousness of academia, female friendships and the saccharine illusion of love that often exists in them. And you think, oh, this is going to be an interesting critique of popular girls and toxic female friendships and maybe the push and pull that exists between girls who have kind of succumbed to the feminine and frilly expectations that are put on women and on the other hand girls that are not like other girls but misdirect their hatred at other women and the story really is like that until it just completely loses it the train derailed the door unhinged. There's one thing you need to know before you pick up this book because I'm raving about it and that is that it is an absurd satire with horror elements. If that sounds cool to you, if that sounds a little like not your thing, you're probably gonna find this book too weird and you're not gonna enjoy it. But if you enjoy absurdity, This book is gonna be your, your favorite new thing. Who knows? Maybe I read another favorite book in the last week of this year, in which case you will see it in my upcoming video in which I rank every single book I read in the year from worst to best. So if you don't wanna miss that video, make sure you subscribe. Nice segue to plugging you to subscribe. Thank you for spending this time with me and letting me rave about my favorite books please leave in the comments below what your favorite book of the year was thank you for being here i really hope you enjoyed this video and i will see you soon in another video very soon okay goodbye